people and also representing the InSafe network here. Um, this workshop is the workshop Privacy is Innovation 308, in case anyone was wondering. Um, I'm going to start this whole debate. As you can see, we have a very large panel, 10 people up here. Uh, so it will be an open uh, discussion in a sense. Um, but I'm going to start by taking five minutes out of the debate to say a few words about uh, the objective today, um, which you could say in a very simplistic way, it is to rebrand privacy with the help from these young people here and here. Um, if you look at the history of online privacy, it has so far lived in three momentous stages. Um, an early stage, which uh, where anonymity was described as this kind of unique opportunity to experiment with identity and challenge uh, under its protection, of course, established forms of power and constituted market models. Um, this description was, of course, also based in uh, the perception that the internet is a new free territory where all social and market rules don't apply. Um, now that stage has been followed by a second stage where we could claim that online privacy has in some sense gained a bad reputation, meaning that it's been named and blamed for a lot of things, including uh, being a cover for illegal activities, to being an obstacle to innovation, juxtaposed to everything that is social, public, uh, and shared, and for that reason also contrasted to open innovation in uh, big data, cloud services, social media, and so on. And some have even, uh, at this age, in this age of social sharing, have announced privacy debt. I'm not mentioning any names here. Um, and yet, under these changing cultural conditions, uh, we've had heard several vocal voices that have consistently reminded us why privacy or individual, uh, individual empowerment for both youth and adults um, still has remained a basic human uh, demand and a foundation for these spacious spaces where creativity uh, and uh, free thinking and in, including innovation can thrive. Now, in the past few years, and here we come to the main point of this uh, discussion today, uh, we see a third stage emerging, one where users, while they embrace uh, online social media, they still demand also to set their own boundaries to create circles of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, this very complex, deeply humanly uh, rooted ability to set the context of our interactions. So privacy in this later stage is becoming a market demand, at least I, I think so, because surveys, they show, if you look at surveys, uh, from the last couple of years, they show that users are increasingly asking to trust the services they use. And a lack of trust uh, will actually affect uh, their practices. And also, if you look at this year's uh, reports about the rising popularity of services uh, that, um, that, for example, uh, have multimedia messages that disappear after receipt, like Snapchat, or uh, social media services that promise co privacy and confidentiality um, to their users, such as, for example, Path. You can also see that there is starting, there is a paradigm shift in what privacy means today. So this, including, and of course, you can't have a privacy debate without mentioning Snowden, but uh, including Snowden's revelation of this uh, blanket internet service, uh, uh, internet surveillance. This is, creating, is creating a momentum for a new definition, maybe a different business model. So today's panel is about starting this discussion to uh, talk about how we might rebrand privacy as something that may exist in an open social public space as an area of opportunity and innovation and a basis for new great inventions. So, Again, as I said, we have 10 panelists, even more panelists on the floor. Uh, I think we also have, might have some remote participants, which Micaiah Gordon from the UK Youth IGF is in charge of. And so just to start, I've told everyone we need to keep intervention short, so I also have to go on now. Um, I have a clock, and I'm not afraid to use it. Just to, uh, to introduce the panelists here, uh, we have representatives from, one of them is coming here, from the industry, uh, from Google, Max Seng, uh, he works in Google's policy team in Berlin. We have from Microsoft, uh, the chief online safety officer, Jacqueline Boucher. Uh, so 
more. I was talking the wrong way. <laughs> we have a, a representative from the academia, Kitty Stell, who's associate professor at the IT University, which is also a person I've organized this uh, workshop with. Uh, and we have uh, representatives from governmental institutions, uh, Klaus Jord, who is a senior uh, consultant in the Danish Film Institute. And we have Malko Sarte Steiner, uh, who is head of the Department for Analysis and Public Communication in the Ministry of Administration and uh, Digitization in Poland. And then, of course, we have uh, our five young youth panelists, Jack Hasmo and Matthew uh, Jackman from the IGS project in the UK. We have Bastian Spannenberg, uh, where are you? you are there, sorry, <laughs> you were sitting too close, uh, from uh, the Netherlands uh, Youth IGS project. And we have Louis Ivan Quente here next week, who is from Austrix Hololab and Cardi. And then Gian uh, Moni Soriano, uh, ICD Net uh, Y ambassador over here. So I want to ask, I want to start the discussion by asking the youth, because I think that you might be able to tell us something about the trend for future use and maybe a different meaning of privacy. So how could we think innovatively about privacy and issues of control? What do you need? Is anyone jumping to start? Louis, do you? Let me start, yeah. Um, well, I think uh, we have got to a point in which uh, we really need privacy. I mean, it's part of our human condition and we really need it. Uh, and, you know, with all the NCA, our prison scandal, we are starting to think about, uh, as you said, other kind of business models to, to, you know, to empower startups. So instead of having a, a, you know, centralized Facebook that has a big database of all our life and sells it to, you know, to another uh, companies or so on, uh, I just want to propose a new like model to code that software using peer-to-peer. -peer. So instead of uh, you know having all our data or, or giving away our data to other companies that have you know like centralized servers and a centralized database, I propose to use like peer-to-peer -peer software so we can build a peer-to-peer -peer Facebook. So I own my data, I have my data in my computer, and then I share my data with the rest of the network by not giving away my data to a single company and then sell it. I think uh, you know it's a technical way of solving like a uh, problem we are trying to solve from a political perspective. And I think the technical perspective is uh, easier. It's just you know code, and we can do it. We have the resources, we have the tools to develop peer-to-peer -peer applications like a Facebook peer-to-peer. -peer. So why not? I mean, let's do it. Let's build a peer-to-peer -peer Facebook that re respects our privacy as users, and not a you know centralized company that controls the whole network and that creates, you know, wallet gardens and sells our data. So that's, that's my point of view. Thanks. Thank you. Is anyone... Yeah? Hello, I'm Matthew from the Youth IGS, uh, representing ChildNet. And when I kind of think about privacy, it, it comes to me in kind of two, two channels, really. It's the, the personal, the stuff I want to protect, and then the practical element, and how do I do that with security. And you're completely right that I feel that there is a, a huge demand for privacy and there's a demand to protect. And that becomes and is the way we use on the internet, the how much we trust each site. And I think the trust element in, in the ISPs is, is massive. I I trust I trust Facebook because they their application when they say view as a friend, um, you know, increases that trust because I, I can see it from the outside perspective. What can I actually what am I actually giving away? And I think there needs to be more applications because applications and phone, mobile devices um, are obviously how the internet has been used globally now. And I, I you know, apps that increase the trust in, in um, the ISPs, so apps in which not just for Facebook, um, but allow you to go and view your profile from the different aspects, so from the complete random to the friend to to yourself, and, and, and maybe an app that you know rates each site and then is sent to the ISP so they can see how well they're protecting each and every person. But yeah, for me it comes in, well, privacy from the word, and that privacy meaning individual free. It's about what I'm protecting, and I want to trust the site that I'm giving my information to. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Zach from the Youth IGF project in the UK. Um, for me, uh, privacy is sort of what allows us to keep what we know to ourselves. 
and as long as we're protecting that data that we have and that media that we have ourselves, um, as long as we've got that kept to ourselves and we're not sharing it, then there shouldn't really be a problem. As long as we're censoring what we're putting online, um, there shouldn't be any problem that arises from that. Um, the main uh, media, social media sites that I use are Facebook and Twitter. Um, Twitter is sort of my more day-to-day -day use that I, I use and I tell you what I'm doing. Um, and Facebook I use for sort of more media sharing, sort of photos and music and things. Um, as for privacy settings on there, um, on Facebook, um, mine are sort of more lenient. I'm not on the strictest ones, but I allow myself to censor what I'm putting online before I put it online, and then my settings will censor it accordingly on there. Um, with over you know a billion users on Facebook, I feel I don't need to share it with all of them. They don't need to know about me as long as I have me and my friends online. That's fine. That's all. That's all that matters. Um, with regards to Twitter, they haven't got a huge amount of privacy settings on there. Um, so I make sure that, me personally, I censor what I put out so it's appropriate for, like, for all age groups and for everyone to see. Um, I also um, use Xbox Live quite a lot. I'm a bit of a gamer. Um, and as with regards to privacy settings on there, that's sort of, um, I control myself. So when I'm sort of chatting online during a game, as long as I'm not giving away my personal information, you know, my, my age, my address, my things like that, um, then there isn't an issue there. Um, I only put in data to sites that I, tr that I trust, sort of like um, Amazon, I'll give them my banking details and my address, things like that, and obviously my online banking, they're going to need that. Um, but yeah, it's sort of personal censorship of my data and then using the privacy settings accordingly on social media sites. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bastian from the Netherlands. Um, part I'm going to school. Um, I work at two companies. Uh, one is Bleep, it's a telecom provider for young people, and the second one is that I own a web shop. It's Woodify. Uh, we sell wooden sunglasses, and I feel that everyone um, sees privacy just as a threat, but I think it can also be an opportunity. Um, for example, with Woodify, we use Facebook to, you know, to show ads to our users, and everyone knows with Facebook. We can target ads, you know, we want to see people from the Netherlands who are between, for example, 18 and 25 years. And all those people saw um, an advertisement from us. And most of them liked the advertisement they saw. So they saw an advertisement based on their on who they are. But they actually liked it, so um, they, they went to our site. Some of them bought a pair of sunglasses. And they're happy with a pair of sunglasses. So it's also an opportunity because it makes people happy. And you know, it also offers me a way of like earning of a turnover of 200k in just seven months. So it, it's also an opportunity, and we shouldn't forget that. Of course, there's a downside of this. I mean, wooden sunglasses is a harmful, harmful, harmless. It's not a harmful project. So if it's a harmful product like medicines, you shouldn't do that. But it can also be an opportunity, and we shouldn't forget that. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jian and I'm an ICT Network Ambassador from Hong Kong. So for me, privacy to me is my you know, personal information, name, date of birth, address. And to me, uh, privacy is something that I have a choice if I want to share it uh, with other people or not. And admittedly, like the youth today is like the most common internet user. So it's like we're more prone to internet threats, especially if we lack the knowledge to responsibly use the internet. And um, there's uh, it's crucial that we don't we don't really know who to trust like, where we should share our personal data or not. So um, many privacy um, issues have been arising like apps are you know sucking up our data or hacking. Um, twenty five percent of the free apps like, they don't really have secure privacy policies. And because of that I think that the youth also has um, increasing demand for better privacy security settings and um, I think that it's crucial to have the choice to pick up what we want um, for example when it comes to ads um, I think that we should have the choice to see what kind of ads that we want to see instead of um, just you know uh, getting our search histories and predicting what kind of ads that we uh, predicting what kinds of ads they will show us I think it's necessary that what we see is like what we want. Oh, thank you.
Thank you. The next panelist on the floor here is uh, Gide Stahl from the IT University. And Gide has actually worked for the last, we agreed on, 15 years on use, the user trend uh, in both mobile and social media. Last time you were the Danish coordinator of the EU Kids Online Survey, which was, uh, had 18, was looking at 18,000 young people all over. 25,000, oh wow. Um, and you're publishing new results from a European survey, Netshield Go Mobile now. Um, so I just want to ask you, can you see uh, some trends? Have you seen some trends in uh, user behavior among you? Uh, you told me, for example, that as earlier that you see a trend to increasingly ask for control, and I think that's what we heard from the young people here as well. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yes, sure, and uh, thanks for mentioning, because it's a little bit daring to come after these personal voices of the youth. So, but I have been studying and talking to a lot of young people, and we have this youth, uh, this youth databases, uh, and I've been doing comparative studies over 10 years, where I compared, uh, did the same study five times uh, over 10 years, so, so I have some kind of sense of continuity and development. I want to step back a little bit just to say that one of the main results we have is that it's very difficult to give one answer to, to give one kind of picture of what the situation is because one thing that impacts very much uh, what the experiences and attitudes towards well, various things such as privacy is is uh, that it uh, of course depends on age and gender and background and so on but also very much which country you come from which part of the world and which history with digital media your part of the world has because the awareness of issues such as privacy and, and other things depend very much on uh, experience. And we can hear here that, uh, that these young people uh, base their attitude towards privacy very much on their own personal experiences and at the exact moment of time where they experience these things and the, the context where they are. And these, these young people are from Europe uh, and from Hong Kong, uh, but in other parts of the world, the history with digital media would give a completely different picture. Another thing is, of course, the the general attitude, I mean, the, the, the issues of trust and risk in society, which is, uh, seems to be very important as well. In Denmark, for instance, people trust the system because, I mean, that's just what we do. And, and that has actually had an impact on how you also trust the digital systems. Another part of the world is quite different. So that's one uh, main thing. But then another thing I really think is very important here is exactly, well, uh, issues of trust and risk that we heard about, but also the fact that that young children, well, young uh, people, uh, just like everyone else, but specifically young people, are somehow caught between this need for being constantly updated and constantly uh, connected, uh, constantly having access to information and all the different services that you can get through digital media, and then on the other hand, also being in uh, control to a certain degree. And, and it's not as much as we can see in, in our surveys, uh, always a matter of having the, the right applications or technologies or so on, because that's, those are technical solutions that are kind of invisible sometimes. And if we ask about them, then, well, if we are not depressed, we can say, about the level of how uh, young people uh, use these settings and these opportunities. It's much more about the feeling of being in control, the fact that you want to control who you talk to, in which situations, who knows where you are, at what time, in which times, and so on. This is in Denmark, very few young people actually use uh, things like the uh, so, uh, uh, location-based services and so on, because they prefer actually still text messages because it's so much easier to be in control of who you talk to. So it's very much about this personally based control rather than the technical solutions. So I suppose that it's kind of, well, again, it's a very diverse picture, but it's a combination of these uh, very complicated uh, things about what the systems and the technologies provide and how are they visibly or openly uh, uh, implemented in, in everyday life and, and what are the attitudes towards being in control and how do young people act towards that. And then just one final comment, it's very obvious here that there's something going on also over time that first the attitude that, well, it's also an opportunity that we don't have privacy because the system can provide you with all the you want to just personalize information and so on. And, and that's quite different from uh, attitudes from 20 years ago. So it's very obvious that, that attitudes also change over time, and I think that that's part of the need for innovate our thoughts about uh, how we deal with these issues. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Peter. So, uh, I'm going to go now to the industry participants here uh, from Microsoft and Google. Very clear now that you now when we hear both Peter and the young people that choice, uh, personalized sense of privacy, control is is an issue or is something that is important when we talk about privacy. Now, data is one type of capital, but apparently trust is also a type of capital. And I mean, if, if you look at uh, services, uh, you can see that, that uh, lately there's been an increase in, for example, looking at uh, deselecting services people don't trust or uh, not using applications they don't trust. So I just want to hear your opinions about, first of all, like how do you use strategies to, uh, to um, to build user trust, and also how you innovate in privacy in uh, Microsoft and Google. And I don't know who would like to go first. Thank you, and thank you to Gree for inviting us to participate in this panel today. Um, I work in the group called Trustworthy Computing at Microsoft, and we focus on security, privacy, reliability, and my specific area of concentration is online safety. I would say specifically that it, it, trust is a very emotional construct, and it takes a lot for us to build trust with each other. It probably takes even more time to build trust with an organization. Uh, it's a long-established relationship, and there have to be certain uh, attributes that take place. You need to feel safe, although we can't qualify that as an actual absolute state of being. You need to feel secure, but we want to say more secure. More, we want to build those more trusted online experiences. In terms of strategies from industry, I, I think there are some strategic considerations that we, we need to take into account. Um, from a variety of stakeholder groups. So we're talking about consumers and companies, organizations, uh, even governments. Individuals and organizations are asking important questions about how their privacy is being protected. And privacy, as many people have said so far, is, is means very many different things to very many different people. I think we, we run the gamut of privacy doves to privacy hawks and every, every uh, flavor in between. So companies need to make sure that they're offering individuals the ability to be where they want to be on that scale and how they want to control what they, what they distribute, what they put out there online, uh, and what have you. Uh, data collection and analysis, I think, are going to be core to innovation moving forward. Uh, and personal data increasingly have that economic and social value. Uh, companies are also increasingly collecting and using and hosting and, and sharing privacy impacting data. It's core to their business models. And we're also seeing heightened scrutiny from legislators or regulators, advocacy community, activists, researchers, media, and of course the public. So again, I think it comes back to a need for conversations, uh, a need for, the, to, for discussing the common good, and I think we need sort of a collective viewpoint on how we use data. Thank you. Thank you. Max? Thanks for inviting us, too. Um, I think there's already been quite a number of interesting aspects I hope uh, to add a little bit. I work in uh, Google's Berlin office, um, and as uh, many of you will know, Germany has a particular um, sensitivity and interest in um, good data usage. So, um, yeah, we believe there is quite some innovation um, and uh, privacy-relevant innovation coming out of Germany, and I'll go into that in a second. But let me start by um, putting out two um, stories or quotes. One is um, from <coughs> um, Wilson, and he says, everything that comes into the world when um, you're young is natural and um, it's just the way it is. Everything that comes into the world after you're 30 seems somehow um, crazy and um, we should better watch out that it's not destroying the world that, um, and the good in a way it used to be. And I think that's a lot what we are seeing is um, that a lack of expertise always causes insecurity and basically in the end um, asks for better control and um, you know we have to gauge this. And um, therefore I think it's a, it's a really appropriate um, setup that you have chosen for this panel to talk to the youth and to hear the way that they are using and um, really uh, benefiting from the technology. If you look at uh, Dana Boyd's work that uh, you have quoted in your article, I think it's absolutely correct. You know, 
I remember when I got on the net, I figured it out, I looked around, maybe I got a bloody nose or two, but um, this is the way that you learn. You have to um, experiment and then you find out the way things work out for you. And um, then a boy describes how kids are super aware of um, what they're sharing and um, how they're sharing. and. Um, they do have a sense of privacy, even though they share a lot. So I think there is many misconceptions of well-meaning parents and experts who try to, um, you know, basically exercise their parental control. And I'm not 100% sure that that is the right approach for um, finding the solutions that are appropriate and innovative in the sense that um, we're going forward. And that leads me to a number of dichotomies that. Um, I would observe when it comes to um, privacy and the way that we talk about it and try to get it right. The first one, and I think it's uh, probably the most important one, is the uh, conflation between privacy and security. In many, many aspects and in many debates, an understanding of what um, I do as a private person and want to keep to myself and to um, my social context, etc., is conflated with um, data theft or surveillance and security breaches. I think that's uh, a big mistake to conflate the two. Second one is between the traditionalists and what I've called um, progressive thinkers. So people who want to cons conserve the way it used to be where you know nobody knew what I was doing and why are you sharing all of this here. Uh, this is a, a view where you want to conserve um, the past, basically. And people who think, OK, there's all these new tools. How can we benefit and get it right? third one is between people who are genuine, what I would call Habermasian thinkers who try to find solutions, and people who are just privacy professionals, basically paid guns, who um, you know, argue this way or the other, and um, are not actually trying to solve something, but to make money or to um, make, build a career out of this. Now, <coughs> I think um, a point that is um, really important to, to point out in this context is also it's absurd to think of Google as a data collecting, privacy destroying monger because what Google wants to do is to deliver a good service for um, its users. That's the only the, um, the reason we are out there to make money by providing a good service and building trust for the user. So um, I can say that we have more than 100 people at Google working at this stuff, doing user research, trying all kinds of controls, and trying to figure out what works. Because interestingly enough, we um, have put all kinds of settings that people are not using them. So you can have the most sophisticated privacy settings, but if it's too complicated for people to use it, and privacy is one of these subjects, when you ask them in a survey, they all say, oh, it's really, really important. But when you ask, okay, and what are you doing about it, nobody's actually doing anything. So I think um, we have to really be um, honest with ourselves as regards the um, interest and the actually willingness to go the extra mile to um, safeguard your privacy if you want. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, it might show through that um, I have a, a philosophical um, approach to this. I have a, um, a PhD in philosophy, so I spare you with some of the uh, private versus intimate, private versus secret, private versus um, civic participation part of it, which I think is quite a, um, let me um, go on the la last one a little bit, private versus um, uh, civic participation. It's actually a civic duty to participate in uh, the public as a private person um, in contrast to your professional duty. When I'm here sitting um, for Google, I'm obviously going to make a different argument. And this is the kind of distinction between the private participation and privacy in the sense that I can act as a private person in, uh, versus my professional um, uh, participation in a discussion like that. So just some food for thought for um, how we can construct this, and um, I'm going to give you a very short list because you asked for that, and how Google is innovating in that space. One is we are actually um, you know, seeing it as an opportunity to say privacy made in Germany to test with um, one of the most sensitive, uh, sensitive uh, people in um, the world about these um, subjects to work there and work with the people um, around there. Uh, more than 30 people working on it in Germany. The dashboard, um, many people don't know about this, Google slash dashboard, you can see all the privacy settings for all the Google products that you're using. And you might have signed up for more Google products than you remember. So when you go on there, you'll see all of a sudden, oh my god, I've never used that product for uh, 10 years. You can quit the um, account, or you can change the settings the way you want. 
I think um, Circles and Google Plus is actually um, a very smart analogy that makes it easier for people to understand with whom they are sharing, etc. It's not actually such a new thing. There used to be lists in Facebook and other products, but the way it's um, built from a usability point of view in Google Plus is actually smarter, I think, than in many other products. Uh, another Max, one. I'm going to use my watch now. So you should. You, you should. I have uh, only two more. So um, the incognito mode in, in Chrome is something that I highly recommend in terms of um, browsing without there being any record of what you're doing because you do want there to be a record um, in order to get better service. And I leave it there. Thank you. Um, moving on from the industry perspective, it's also interesting to hear the policy perspective on this because the uh, it also you you could you can feel and you hear this a lot at the IGF that you need a kind of innovation in policies privacy policies as well. Uh, currently, it seems that we have a privacy self management system. I'm not sure it's it's enough. Uh, um, but I don't know uh, how do we think innovatively about privacy and data protection policies and regulations. I was myself thinking that maybe you could build privacy policies into innovation policies, but uh, I don't know. Should do the ladies first, uh, again, Mrs. Stein, why not? Um, thank you. So uh, just to remind you, I work for Polish government, and we are very active on, on the data protection uh, topic right now. Um, and we are very active uh, because uh, we feel that this is what, what our citizens um, expect from us. And so, of course, you know, we have like very, we have very useful voices here of, uh, of the youth participants, so thank you for them. Uh, we know surveys that show um, that people are increasingly worried about their privacy, and they might, and as Max said, they might not, not yet uh, put it into action, but they increasingly actually um, take into account the settings of their products and, uh, and try to fix their privacy settings as much as they can. So we think that certainly like the awareness raising part is crucial, and no policy will um, actually substitute for awareness raising, because we do believe that you should get products um, that fit your personal uh, preferences and not that you should get products that are unified uh, by policies. Um, so we think awareness raising is the most important part and this is something that we should do uh, all together. Uh, with companies and in Poland we are going to start next week a big coalition uh, for privacy that is going to include companies, it's going to include um, general data protection officer and public sector representatives uh, that will be educating people and about privacy as a positive concept. Con concept. So we are not um, interested in, uh, in depicting privacy as a threat, yeah? so we don't think it's a useful uh, kind of approach. We think uh, it should be something that is seen as an opportunity. But to do that, we need cooperation of all the stakeholders. Um, and here I come to the, uh, to the policy question. Yeah? So this cooperation is not, not only needed in coalitions about awareness raising, this cooperation is also needed in terms of finding, wa uh, finding ways to regulate or to adjust our regulations to the current uh, state of events. Um, and I think it's a little bit um, courageous to talk about innovation in policy, uh, because actually our policy needs a catch up. Um, and we need to like, be aware that, the poli that Europe is actually considered as a pretty like, high standard in terms of privacy, but our uh, directive for, uh, that regulates privacy in all actually in all countries, yeah, that has been transposed uh, into laws uh, of all member states. Um, it's from the year 95, and I believe uh, Mark Zuckerberg was like 9 or 11 uh, <laughs> when, this, when this directive was written. Um, so it's been a while ago, yeah? It's been a while ago, and there is no way that this law is, uh, is adapted to the current, uh, current development. Uh, and I do not believe that law should preempt uh, the future development, because this is the way to stop innovation. But I do think there is a need to adjust uh, to the to the new uh, well, uh, new context given us uh, by the digital, by the digitization and the potential of, of the usage of data uh, in uh, in the digital world. So currently, um, the EU is working on a new general um, data protection direct, um, regulation. So it's going to be a regulation, not a directive, and this is going to be like a basic. Uh, basic uh, law, piece of legislation that will actually, in my opinion, um, adjust the, uh, the current uh, well, the current framework to the uh, digital reality. For example, um, by um, by expanding the definition of data 
because of course, like previously, it was you know only probably name, surname, and other things that would lead to direct identification of a person would be considered data. And right now, you can identify a person based on two random information pretty easily yeah, using the web. So there is a need to expand uh, the definition of what personal data is. Uh, because simply you need less data to find out who is who. Yeah, so we think it needs expanding. Uh, similarly, in terms of profiling, so we know it's a, of course it's a, a basis for many businesses to function, and we don't want to forbid pro profiling or uh, or make it like too hard to be um, relevant. Uh, but we do want to set some rules for profiling uh, because we do, we do believe that people should be informed and that they are pr profiled and that their characteristics are used to give them. Um, a special kind of service, and they should have a choice. And we do believe that should that profiling shouldn't lead to to legal consequences for a person. Yeah? So we don't want to, and so we feel that the citizens don't want to live in the world uh, where, for example, you can be um, for you can be prevented from getting credit uh, because of the friends you have on Facebook, yeah? or because of the, the, the your environment that you derive from, your family background, or whatever. Yeah? So this is something that's really important and that is currently only scarcely regulated. There is no way it could have been regulated well in 95. And so these are the examples of the changes that are going to come with this law. But again, we don't believe it should stifle, it should inhibit uh, innovation, and that is why in Poland we work uh, very intensely with private sector representatives and with NGOs uh, to figure out uh, which elements of this uh, general data protection regulation are acceptable for all sides and which would be too far. Yeah? And this is really important for us to, to make sure that this, is, uh, that this regula regulation doesn't go too far in either direction. Uh, so it will not take care of everything, and we still believe that user awareness will be the, the core of, of privacy for the future. But I think it will be helpful, and it will give us a helpful framework for people to at least be fairly informed and, and, uh, and to, well, in basically informed about what choices they are making. Um, and I want to stress one more point, uh, because we, so, you know, some research show that uh, even right now the market for data, uh, for, for privacy is, uh, and using data in digital services is like 330 billion a year worth, this is an enormous amount, uh, and also for, for public sector, uh, using personal data on data in general is very useful, yeah, so we also know that in order for the government to improve our services, I'm not talking about spying, yeah, but to improve our services, let's say health services for citizens, um, we can very well use data. Yeah? So data helps us to give people personalized services. And of course, we are also under pressure. So if Google is improving its products all the time, the citizens, when they come to the government, they are not like uh, they, they are not expecting the 19th century uh, type of service. Yeah, so they they, they learn from Google, from Microsoft from other companies what the standard is, and they expect similar things from the government. And then I wouldn't like to be the public servant who, who, public servant who then needs to say, uh, well, sorry, we are the government, so we will stick to the 19th century um, type of uh, giving you the service, which will not be personalized, which will not take into account your personal preferences, and so on. So we also want to use these opportunities. But we do believe that it's, um, you know, the analogy to currency is very, very good in this sense, yeah? It's really dependent on trust. So in the same way, I think the private sector and public sector is in the same boat on that, that we really need trust to continue uh, uh, improving our services as, as a government and as pri private sector companies. And to have this trust, we need to have a clear legal framework that we are currently working on in the EU, and we need to have awareness raising that we will all work on. Yeah, so that's, um, I think we are in one boat at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. Um, Klaus, uh, you are not an, uh, your area is not privacy regulation, but it's media policies, and that's actually why you've been brought here, because it's interesting to have a person with a different perspective, but still with an experience in the area of policy making. So do you have, what, do you, what do, would you like to add? To the Just a small comment, because what I would, uh, actually I think we are living in amazing times, because we are used to that, from seeing from a parent's perspective, we are used to that we can trust the government to regulate the way young people, children and young people use media. Let's talk, I would, what, would like to talk a little bit about film classification because the, the nature of film classification, censorship from the government is that, well, 
if we put down an age for a, for a specific film, adults can trust that you cannot go to the cinema to watch this movie. So usually parents and teachers, for that matter, are used to the trust we can put in the government. But in this field, when we talk about privacy, when we talk about the new media, we are putting the trust to the company. So there's a shift, and you can say the role of government in this respect is twofold. One is, of course, regulation, but another thing is to, how, is to explain how these processes are actually going on to teachers, to parents who are, you can say, to some extent lost in cyberspace when it comes to raising children in, this, in, in these matters, because they don't know how, they don't know their the, the technologies, they don't know what kind of troubles their young people can get into if they have a long track or bad track on, on Facebook or whatever. So I think this is the role of government, and I'm very uh, much agree with you from Poland that that we have a dilemma because we are always on the back track as a government agency on what's happening out there because first of all the young people they're running very fast and also the companies are running very fast after the young people and uh, then we are sitting back there sometimes we're feeling we're sitting back there what should be our role should we be on top of this should be the, should we be the watchdog or should we just say well this is as it used to be a question of government ruling I don't know, I don't think we should go by uh, that track, but it's the dilemma for the government in these times. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Well, now we're actually opening up to the floor, but just to sum up, you can see that we are actually discussing a kind of definition of privacy here, um, for the young people emphasizing control, uh, personalized definition, and trust is an issue as well. Um, from the industry, um, you can say you mentioned some dichotomies between different stakeholders and, and different um, uh, people having different opinions and that we need to meet in the middle to have some practical solutions to some of the privacy threats there are also here. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to leave it out in the open and then open to the floor but, but one thing I was thinking and it's a question that I'll just leave out in the open is that um, you often hear that privacy is a construct, it's a cultural construct, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a meaning in everyday life and that we don't have a right to privacy, for example. Um, time is a cultural construct, so the question is, do we need a new standard definition of privacy or like we defined a standard time at one point? But uh, does, any, it's not, does anyone have a question from the floor? Yes, down there, Larry. Sorry, I don't know, do we have a microphone from that? Comment and a reaction from the gentleman from Google from, from Germany. I really appreciated your comments, especially about the privacy professionals, because I, I do think it's, it's true that we have in this field professionals who are both representing industry and representing NGOs and representing themselves, and there, there has become sort of this, um, I, I actually recently wrote an article called Beware of the uh, Internet Safety Industrial Complex, which is a play on words of a speech that uh, former President Dwight Eisenhower made in 1960, where he talked about how the defense contractors and the military kind of got together to scare us into spending more money uh, to defend ourselves. And I get the sense sometimes that we just have a series of moral panics in, in technology. It started with the predator panic around 2004, where in America, we were all convinced that there was a predator behind every keyboard and if our kids go online they're going to be sexually abused until research proved that that was statistically, although possible, extremely unlikely. And then we had the bullying panic that we're still going through where uh, we see studies 82% of children are bullied. Well, that's, if, first of all, totally not true. The credible studies show it's a much lower level uh, and that many children have, handle it with a certain amount of resilience, not to diminish the importance of it, but again, a moral panic. And now we're having a privacy panic where we hear constantly about how vulnerable we were. I was talking yesterday with Jacqueline about this whole NSA situation. And companies like Microsoft and Google are legally not allowed to disclose the number of queries they've gotten from the government. But the extent to which we have seen data, and some of it has come out, the numbers are very, very small. So while it is an important consideration, no American should be or anyone should be spied upon by the government, but 
I think that millions and millions of people think they're being spied on, and in fact, it may be just hundreds of people in a population of 300 million. So we have to put all of this into perspective. Again, one abuse of anybody's rights is one too many, but this notion that, that privacy is simply out the window, uh, I think that there are people who have a vested interest in perpetuating that because it enhances their careers, as the Google person said, but at the same time, there are people in industry who have a vested interest because they want to uh, control and limit regulation. So it's really up to people to look at this critically, put on the same critical thinking skills that we tell children to use, and not overreact uh, to some of these allegations. Thank you. Do you, Max, you, are there any hands here? Max? I'd uh, like to quickly respond to that. So first of all, I think, um, I, I slightly disagree on the surveillance stuff because I think it's really, really important that we do have that conversation right now and get the checks and balances in place. So it is, you know, however um, bad people feel about it, if we get the right consequences, and that means we um, find a means to um, develop more transparency and to get that thing under control, it's good that it wasn't as bad as it's blown up in the media sometimes, but it's um, even more important that we use this opportunity to get it right. Um, on your first point, I think um, you know many times we're, it's, it's very legitimate concerns, but um, everybody who has a hammer sees nails all over the place. And I just wanted to point out that next to getting it right in terms of um, legally finding um, the, the right framework, there's many times smart technology solutions. Let me um, take one example from another field, which is copyright. Um, you know, it's very, very difficult to control um, the flow of information online. And um, you know, you can write as many laws and, and restrict people and restrict the freedoms and the potential of the technology in many ways and try to get it right. Um, we don't have problems with um, the content industry anymore in terms of YouTube because we did a developed content ID which basically hashes all the content and finds um, when somebody's up uploading um, a copyrighted content. And that is not a legal or a policy solution, it's a technology solution. And I think in many ways you know, we should get experts to think about this and reframe it until we get it right rather than um, limiting people's freedoms and benefits of using the technology um, by trying to find the right laws. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, I will also need to react to the surveillance uh, thing because, uh, so I wouldn't uh, really see it as that harmless. Yeah? So the scale was huge um, and it's not, because there are two statistics that are being mixed oftentimes and one is like what uh, the amount of uh, inquiries that, that Google, Facebook or other companies get and the other thing is uh, whether there was something beyond this going on. Uh, and, uh, well, all the evidence that we have shows that there was something beyond it and actually the thing that uh, um, makes us uncomfortable is that, that there wasn't uh, an enough uh, clear uh, statements from the U.S. government uh, explaining that. And this is a thing that is really, um, well, so we should, like, for example, in Europe, what we have, and, and that's the role of legislation again, yeah, there, is, there are actually cl uh, clear rules on data retention. Um, and the retention can be from six months to two years, depending on the country. So a country, a European country can choose whether it's two years or six years, uh, or sorry, six months or two years. But definitely after this time, the data stored by telecommunications uh, companies need to be destroyed. Um, and what we are also worried about is that no one told us that the data gathered by the NSA will be destroyed at any time. Uh, and this is uh, where it's am because I know um, I don't think, of course, so this is not um, like a little, um, a little people who sit and read every email <laughs> that we are sending, and this is not like that. Yeah, but this data is gathered and stored somewhere, and no one gives us a guarantee that it will be deleted after a due time, and that's a problem because uh, for now we might think, so many of us will think, okay, I don't have that much to hide, so so what's the problem? Yeah, but if at some point in our life we want to make, I don't know political career or an courageous step that is not very popular with some government, we don't want this government to have the information about, uh, about us going back 30 years. Yeah? So this is not a very, uh, and this is a really, we believe, um, so if the negative scenario was true, we think it's a threat to human rights and a threat to democracy in long term. Yeah? So if something like that were to uh, be out, out of control, it's a threat to democracy and it's a threat to human rights, and I think it needs to be said clearly and it needs to be explained. 
Um, in terms of uh, reacting to, to what you, Max, said, yes, so in terms of the technology innovation, so we are um, waiting for that with our hands open. Um, so the, uh, well, the history shows that sometimes uh, setting standards, legal standards, helped innovation instead of uh, preventing it. Um, so, for example, research of Michael Porter, who is a Harvard Business School professor and has done a lot of research on competitiveness on companies, um, showed that in countries where, where um, quite early environmental standards were introduced, in those countries there, were, there was more, more innovation on energy efficiency than in other countries who didn't have those standards. So we are introducing some standards that we think are necessary, also because we are worried about current market development in some sense. For example, let me um, just mention the, the market for applications. So there is currently um, an estimated number of 6 million applications uh, that we download for our telephones and so on. It's 6 million, it's supposed to be growing right now by 30,000 applications a day, which is a lot. And so, so it will, in 200 days, we will have like 12 million, <laughs> if this estimate is true. Um, and those applications many times have uh, terms of services that normal user will not be very happy to. So for example, you would download, from my own experience, I will not name names, yeah, but you can download a torch for your iPad and it will ask you to give you data, access to your contacts. What for? No idea, yeah? So now that I pay attention to those terms of service, I'm wondering whether this is a really fair expectation from a customer. Or, or you download um, an application that would track your physical activity, so how fast you run, um, how long you run, and so on, and it will, and it will ask you to agree that, you, that it will give your data to the third party, yeah? which is sensitive data, because uh, like being relatively fit and healthy, I could also think, well, you know, it's quite okay. <laughs> I have nothing to hide. But actually, it's, a, it's possibly a very sensitive data because, as we all know, the information about health can get very sensitive at some point. So this is really, uh, so I, I would try to like balance those things. So it's important to have transparency, um, both about uh, like surveillance um, um, mechanisms and about like normal mechanisms that, uh, that, uh, that we are using in our everyday lives to get services. Can I respond very quickly because people... Yes. I wasn't in any way defending the National Security Agency of my own country, nor was I underestimating the impact of the surveillance. What I'm saying is there was a lot of misinformation. Early on, for example, there was a story about a back door. And unless Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, and all these companies are lying, that back door simply didn't exist. Yet, that became part of the mythology of the story. And all I'm saying is that people need to get a handle on what's true and what isn't true. And I realize there's much we don't know. But let's not spread false, in, false rumors and let's, let's react to real issues rather than fake ones because if there were a backdoor, believe me, I'd be out there marching in the streets and, and probably marching against Microsoft along with the government for allowing that to happen along with all the other companies that allegedly did that but didn't do that, fortunately. Yes, yeah, just a very short comment from a different perspective, but I just wanted to come back to one of your comments on uh, what you said on, uh, on uh, cyberbullying as kind of, well, the we didn't always uh, get the, the problem, uh, not the problem, the right response, but uh, I think as researchers that it's always very, very important to consider which questions we ask, I mean, to ask the right questions in what, which context, because very often we have this kind of presumption how things are and they're being public debate and, and other things, and that heavily impacts how we frame the questions that, uh, that we ask. And at the same time, also I can see here that we're actually we're discussing not two, but multiple things, but at least two main uh, perspectives on privacy. And in this uh, discussion about how to innovate uh, the perception and, and how we work with the uh, privacy issues, I think we need to, on one hand, we, we discuss company stuff, regulation, big data things, all these very overall general things about all the data that flows around there, every, all the digital footprint that we, we set that, that kind of compiles into big databases and how can we control that. And then on the other hand, we have the very personal experiences. And we need to, we need to know much more about those personal experiences and how uh, it works in everyday life for young people but also for, for all of us. I mean, uh, it's very difficult as an individual user to do anything about the big data issues in a way. It comes back to you in terms of the offers you get from your systems and the algorithms that, uh, that uh, kind of, uh, controls who you, which information you get and so on. But on the other hand, uh, it's 
your own experience and your own way of being in control uh, of what you're doing also has a, a, a huge impact on, on how these issues work. So, so coming back to that, I think really we need to, to, to start discussing also with the questions we asked. Shaggy for Shaggy, and then Klaus. Thank you. Just a couple of um, points of feedback, and I hope that we can hear again from the youth because I definitely want to see this panel as coming together, both youth, youth and adults, and all perspectives uh, coming to the table. But just a couple quick points of feedback. I'm very much in favor of awareness raising and education around all of these issues, very much in favor of technology solutions, collaborative efforts among industry and government and NGOs and all other parties that can come to the table. It's important to keep in mind that the decisions that we're making, we hope they're right, but they're the they are the decisions for right now. When we lead with something like regulation, when we lead with something like legislation, that can have very long-term effects, and we don't have that, that nimbleness and ability to, to rejigger if we need to. So I would just keep that in mind, that we should lead with, I agree with Google, you know, there, there might be a technology, technology solution or at least a technology approach. We should look at those holistic frameworks and those multi-pronged approaches before we lead with something more permanent and lasting that we might not be able to get out from under. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on what you said, Larry, on regarding panics. And I think panics is arising from that maybe we are excluding a very important part of the discussion, namely the society. What is society in this respect? Society, in my view, is teachers and parents. It's teachers and parents who has the responsibility by tradition to raise the coming generation in order to let this society continue. And because they have such a huge lack of knowledge of what's going on, and because the relationship between what's going on in this discussion is between the young people and the company, and not having the focus on what is the role of teachers, what is the role of parents, and they, well, I have to say it again, they don't know a lot about this stuff. We made a study in the, in the Media Council uh, half a year ago about what is the dilemmas for teachers. One of the dilemmas they have, can they be friends with young people um, on Facebook? Can they go Twittering with them uh, on the internet? Is this interfering in their privacy sphere, or is it the way teachers always have done, they are having a finger on what's going on in the social life between uh, children and young people in the schoolyard? Well, this is a very big dilemma. And before we solve this, we have to solve this also because if we are not doing this, then the role of society, here represented by teachers or and parents, well, where is that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would love to hear from any of you. Uh, yes. Well, I heard a lot of people saying that it's all about transparency. Um, I think his name is Larry and mentioned about that there are a lot of rumors. Um, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. But that there's a lot of. Um, things going on that are not transparent, but I think lots of things are very transparent. I mean, you gave the example of the flashlight app, which asks for your contact information. Um, you know, when someone comes to you the street, hey, can I see your agenda with all your contacts in it? And can I make a copy? You know, you would think like, come on, I won't do that. But why would you do it when you're in an app? I think it's all about awareness. I mean, it's just common sense, I think. And awareness is very important. Thank you. I see a number of hands. Uh, I will remember you, but I just want to hear, is there any remote participants with questions? No. Okay, so uh, ladies first. <laughs> yeah, I just had a question. Um, I'm Elina from the Netherlands. I'm a student at LSE. And I was wondering what you were saying about cooperation between the multi-stakeholders, which is really important, I think, and about trusting the government and trusting the businesses. Then I was thinking what Gita said about how important the local context is, and I was thinking there are a lot of oppressive governments who I don't think can be trusted in a way. And I was thinking about how uh, businesses should act in those countries, because there are laws there, and should they take a political stand in a way and be um, choosing for the privacy of their uh, customers, or should they be following the laws of the country they work within? So I was wondering about that. Can anyone care to answer? Thanks. So there's an interesting um, uh, 
institution called the Global Network Initiative. It came about after the Shintao case when uh, Yahoo handed over some um, personal information to identify a blogger that was inconsistent. And basically, um, uh, yeah, that it's the goal of that institution, which is a multi-stakeholder place with Human Rights Watch and the Berkman Center and other um, non-private um, sector platform providers. Um, and they're trying exactly that, and it's very difficult um, uh, Edge where you say, of course, you know, when you operate in a country, you have to play by the laws of the country. But in the other, um, the other end of the spectrum, if that country has really um, laws that are against your um, principal um, convictions, then you have a problem. So uh, yes, that's an ongoing and very difficult discussion. Um, we are having it. Yeah. Uh, maybe since there's, uh, sorry, Bianca from NetMission. So uh, maybe since there's uh, corporate around, I just wanted to know how, I mean, it's such a global world and all the services you provide is global. So how do you take maybe a stance on the legal stance and what do you treat as privacy? Like, do you have a very clear line and how do you kind of put an uh, outline on you know, what people think is privacy? Because I think, obviously, you see a lot of youth, they all think quite differently and people, might um, judge personal data in a different sense um, than everyone. So it might be good that to see how you guys see privacy as well as how you kind of defined it and how your services, since it's global and every like, culture is different as well, um, how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very difficult one. Let me uh, give you one analogy. It's basically, um, the, the answer is yes, we have a definition, and that is in our privacy policy. And uh, for example, we had, I think, with all the different products that uh, Google provides, we had, I think it was more than 70 different uh, privacy policies, and then we consolidated them all into one privacy policy, exactly, to uh, uh, reach a point where people understand, okay, this is how, Google, how my data is handled when I work with Google service. Right? We are criticized all over the place because, um, you know, how can you take such a complex matter and make it uh, so easy and complex? Same thing with um, uh, the privacy concerns people had when we introduced Street View in Germany, right? First, there was a big debate about, you know, how can it be and we have to have an opt-in um, uh, or opt-out solution. Then we did that and we got thousands of letters of people saying, oh my God, who um, sent a letter to Google um, uh, allowing my house to be that is absolutely absurd. I want you to uh, put it back on. So um, you, you'll never get it right, but yes, um, we do have one understanding and we try to define that and have a discourse about uh, how it should evolve, how it should get better. Thank you. The gentleman My name is Robert. I'm from the Netherlands as well. And I would like to uh, comment on two things. The first thing is about um, uh, the role of the government, how the government can pressure. Uh, of course, when we look at the NSA uh, scandal, uh, we all look at the, the big corporates, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, as the bad guys, but we forget there is a gun to their head from the government. And um, uh, when you look at privacy, um, it's, you don't have like one profile, one identity online. I mean, you have, for example, when your friends, one of your friends knows way more about you than other friends because you tell them more. And when you look at companies, you should look at them as a relationship where you um, share information with a company or with, a, with, for example, Facebook, and then you, together with Facebook, decide on what information you're going to share with who. That's the kind of relationship you have with such a website. And then when it comes to the government, I, I'm, I mean, I would be happy to share some of my information with the government, but then it should also be like a relationship-based trust. So I can say, okay, maybe I can log in to the government with my Facebook account and select some settings or things they could see as well. Um, uh, but that's the kind of way the government should think about privacy and information as well. Like, okay, we have relationship with people in our country and we should be very clear about what we actually um, gather and should never be through an other relationship like Facebook or Google, which I think is very weird. Then the second thing I want to mention is that um, if we look at data, um, there's so much uh, possibilities we we have with data. For example, I don't I think in the near future we all will be wearing devices that, for example, will measure the quality of our blood. 
And um, if we all hand in this information for the higher cause, to have scientists discover certain trends in the health in countries, they can really act uh, on this information. This will increase the quality of life like very hugely. And um, what I uh, what I want to lead up, uh, what I want to mention, if, if you know the purpose of why you're sharing certain information, you actually will be more uh, more easy and more uh, you'll be sharing it more easily. And um, the, even though it's very valuable information. And um, then if we go back to the present, that's what um, we don't do. We don't think of our information as really valuable. We just share it with, with different companies. And, um, uh, you know, people like to say, well, you're not paying, you're the product. You know, when you're not paying Google, they're using your data and you're the product. But I really dislike it. It sounds very bad because I think people are always underestimating their, their value. You're not a product, you're a failure. Your information is really valuable. And if you understand that your information is valuable for a company and you get value in return, I mean, you can search on the internet or you, you can connect with your friends on Facebook, that's value in return. Then you uh, have a relationship with the company based on these values. And if that's the way you think about your, about your information, about your privacy, it's a very valuable thing uh, then you are uh, deciding way more better on what you share and then um, when it comes to awareness I think this is the, the key thing that we should um, uh, educate people. I mean you're valuable, your information is valuable and please you know you're, you're making a deal with a company using your information so take care about it. Thank you. Thank you. That's a gentleman down here and you have a mic. Great. Thank you. My name is John LaPreeze. I'm a professor at Northwestern University. Um, I'm really concerned by the panel's use of law in, in the discussion. And the reason I'm concerned about this is if we think about the next billion users of the internet, many of those users come from countries where rule of law is weak but at best or arbitrary and capricious at worst. Could the panel please respond to the idea of the role of law in these kinds of countries with all these new users coming about? And how the law may not be such a good partner or even a useful partner in, in addressing these issues. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good comment. Um, there was here. Anyone else who has a question, please raise your hand. So I, okay, yes, thank you. Uh, with the, I, I'm Al Allegra from the Philippines uh, uh, NGO and also a member of APC. Um, when I first read about the title of the innovation and privacy. Immediately what came to my mind is how there's great innovation in the surveillance industry. And R and D and all of these new that's help governments, good or bad, uh, develop these tools for for what they do. So I was wondering in the Philippines we had this big scandal where our president was wiretapped, her cell phone was tapped. And it was made, this is about 10 years ago, or um, very, at, then, at that time, very sophisticated sort of um, um, sniffing tools yeah, of the air. Um, the, and and when, when we dug deeper into the, the dynamic of it, it's all of these um, companies going to our military establishment, uh, presenting and junketing and all of so that these technologies shall be shall be taken. I was wondering if in, in the more advanced regulatory environments, more than ours, if there are regulations about transparency of, of companies like this, in terms of reporting uh, what the technologies, uh, what their technologies are capable of, and who they deal with in terms of, uh, especially governments, because uh, I think uh, when when my government buys something like this, I think I, I should have the right to know if they're buying something like this. So I don't know if, if, if that regulatory sort of angle is being explored in international context. Thank you, and thank you for bringing up that comment because it's actually true. This when you talk about innovation in privacy, there's great innovations in surveillance technologies, great innovations in big data, but that's what we're trying to do with this panel to say how can we look at privacy then we need to even the balance so but Margarina Stein 
Um, so I would like to respond to the gentleman uh, who talked about uh, the countries without uh, rule of law or with weak rule of law and how they can, well, how th uh, the users in those countries can handle uh, their privacy. Um, so there is actually there is no good answer to that, yes, and, and there is many attempts to help many countries improve uh, in terms of uh, the, democra the quality of democracy and rule of law and so on, and that's the only sustainable long-term solution. Um, but it makes me think of, um, of a recent article by Timothy Garten Ash, uh, who said that surveillance, um, as it was in the NSA scandal, and that it, nowadays it needs to be a private-public partnership. Yeah? So it's ni neither pu private nor public, but if something like that exists, it would be probably a private-public partnership. And that's the negative example. The positive example uh, that bases in the same um, phenomena um, is that, of course, um, private companies in those countries can play a, a, a big role in terms of setting these standards. Yeah? And consumers in countries with rule of law and maybe with higher um, awareness about privacy can also play a bigger role. Uh, there is a talk, uh, and I'm not sure whether you've mentioned that already, but uh, some people say that privacy protection and, and privacy in general is a new green movement. Uh, so it's a new movement that you know cons consumer will require the services that are uh, that have the highest standards of privacy protection, and that they will actually through the pressure on companies, um, they might be a more uh, well a, a efficient factor of change than maybe legal instruments. I'm not sure whether this is true. I uh, you know for now you cannot tell. There are some data who seems to support and that this could go in this direction, and some data, uh, again, uh, doesn't support it. So the data that supports it is that the number of people who are worried about um, the amount of data um, in the Internet about them is, uh, is clearly growing. So in 2009, uh, there was only like 33% of people who were worried about their data uh, in the uh, Internet, and now it's 50%. Uh, and more and more people start uh, caring about uh, and worrying about the data, and, and this could uh, could be an indice that you know that the, that more attention will be placed on that, and maybe we will have something like green movement. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but certainly a consumer pressure on on companies, uh, on Google's, on Microsoft, so that they get even more innovative because we all know they have amazing um, human resources on their side, and then can can deliver more innovative solutions than they do even now. So we all believe in their capacity and in their uh, possibilities. Um, so by putting pressure on them as consumers, positive pressure, I mean, um, we are uh, setting the standards for services in our area, but also maybe in countries that don't have uh, such a good rule of law protection. And I also think it was an example of, um, I mentioned the general data protection, no, the data protection uh, directive from 95. Uh, that Europe had, and that was at that time considered a very, uh, like a progressive and high standard uh, data protection legal instrument. Um, it actually spread around the world pretty quickly, uh, because companies in, uh, in countries uh, outside of Europe quickly understood that if they want to uh, sell their products to, you, to European citizens, they will need to apply to the same standards. So then you have like this phenomenon that the companies uh, start to apply the highest uh, standards uh, from the from the most, most difficult market they are active in. Yeah? And in that case, it was the, the European market. So the companies, even outside of Europe, started to adjust the standards of data protection to what we have in Europe. And this is like another like kind of influence, a soft, soft influence that uh, I think a good regulation in Europe um, could have. But as I said, yeah, it must be a combination and between like a consumer pressure on companies uh, so that they stick to um, to good standards in in uh, I'm talking about Europe because I'm from Europe and I know the situation there sorry for that but companies from uh, to keep to certain standards in Europe but also outside of Europe and that's and that's an end of legislation standards that will um, spread by um, well just sharing you know similar standards so that's the combination that could I think help. Thank you. I saw you, Max, but I would like to hear from the youth first, and then I'll best send you and your own comments. Well, I want to follow up on this discussion, and I think it's kind of impossible to enforce a law or try to solve this worldwide problem with laws. I mean, we try to, you know, solve the problem in the entire European Union with law, the cookie issue, 
and the laws different in every country, which makes it very difficult for companies, which makes it very difficult for users to understand what's exactly going on. So I don't think we should try to find a problem in terms of law or enforcement or regulation. I think we should try to find uh, the solution in terms of innovation or um, awareness. I mean, you can innovate on a worldwide level and you can raise awareness on a worldwide level. You can't um, enforce law or regulation on a worldwide level. So th I think that's very important. Thank you. Um, actually, you were... Yes? I, well, I'll before ask you a question. I'll say. Okay, I was just going to say that you know, I completely agree. I just want to pick up something that was said um, by Antonio and in the Microsoft about the kind of scale and degree. I think that it shouldn't right that it shouldn't be the government but it should be given to the, the individual themselves and the choice and the range of choice is important and, and scale and, the, and although as you say it might be complicated and it might you know, distract people with help from you know, educators and teachers I think that if you give it to them they give it to the person who's using it themselves to decide that is the most important thing give the best decision you can make it would say they can give me the decision for my person okay uh, I'm just curious um because that is what we kind of have now, a privacy self-management system, and in a sense, some people are talking about a consent dilemma. Um, do you, do you how I, I may be talking down to you, but can you manage that choice? Uh, can you manage that privacy? Do you, I mean, many will say that it will be difficult to foresee the consequences of correlation of data and so on and so forth. And this is actually a question to all of you also. I was going to say, you know, I think I can manage it, yes, but I think we can manage it, the society can manage it, and, and that's, that's very important, you know, I, I'm, I'm not alone on the internet, I don't think that I'm at all by myself, but together, people who might peer my, my peer monitors can say, look, I can see this from you, so together we can work with it, together we can manage it, yes. Okay, um, which is curious, or Gita just whispered in my ear and said she would like to hear um, if you you think about big data? Do you think about the consequences of correlation of data? Do you think about these surveillance issues? And this is a question to all of you. I don't know, do you have maybe? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm a bit, you know, uh, conspiracy in, in, the, in the sense of uh, what the NCA is doing with all the data. Um, so the NCA is actually don't, don't let in any kind of data. So there is a theory that says that the NCA is doing like the biggest database in the world with our actions and every movement we are doing. So uh, and in the long term, uh, that could lead to, you know, to, to pre predict your to to decisions, for example, to know uh, what I'm going to do with my life uh, when I don't even know, because they, do, they have all my data, they have all of the movements I've made, they have, uh, you know, all my online activity, and I'm very worried about the future of that, because um, when you are logging in in a service, you are trusting that service. You are you are choosing to use that service. I, I can choose uh, to use or not to use email, for example, but I cannot uh, opt out of my government. I cannot say, "Hey, U.S., stop uh, you know collecting my data for email or so on." So that's a bit my my worry that you can you know look out or opt out for using a service that's not uh, like a government or an ICP and so on. I think you have had two comments from the panel and one question down there. And I think Max was the first to raise his hand. Thanks. I think uh, it's a pretty good conversation evolving. Actually, I'd like to come back to um, uh, the um, uh, gentleman from um, Holland who made an excellent point. I think where um, really we are at the heart of this is it the data minimization that we want? So we collect as little data as possible, or do we see data as a resource that? actually a rich thing, we are data rich, not data minimal, and then we can um, decide how we use it. And um, I think all of the discussion, you know, we have to be smart about it and so on and so forth, but this is really at the core. Do we want minimal data? Do we basically want people off and uh, switch it off and, and try to be very, very minimalistic about it? Or do we create a rich world around it, um, produce new services and are smart about how, they are us uh, how we are using it? And I, um, Again, felt it was a, a wonderful argument. You know, many times we get the argument: you get the self-driving cars, you know, you fl fly balloons up in the stratosphere. You can get this data, um, data protection, this privacy thing, right? But there's just some um, requests 
from um, government and activists like the right to be forgotten that is impossible. You know, you cannot take something back that you have said. So, um, you know, even if we tried all our best, it's about the decision, as you said, you know, do you want to put this online or not? And once it is out, you cannot take it back. It's just like what I say right now goes on the record and it will not be possible to take it back. We have an, a very clear case in Germany that I think um, puts this to the core. There was a, a, a bouncer at the, the uh, Reeperbahn in Hamburg um, and uh, he was known under a nickname that um, is, if you want, um, you know, racist. But he liked it, you know, it's like, um, word that I'm not going to uh, re uh, repeat here, but, um, you know, there was people rapping about it and he felt it was really cool. At one point he decided he doesn't like it anymore. So he went to court and he had, you know, the online archives remove that name from the archives. And I think it was a very wrong decision from the court to do that because if it's out, it should stay out. Otherwise, we are really rewriting history. And that is a very dangerous thing. So data protection has to have limits in these kind of things. You cannot expect Google and other companies to be loved it in, in this field. I think it's very dangerous. Thank you. We're really opening up some discussions here, you know, sort of the right to be forgotten. But Klaus first. Just a sh uh, short comment again, also referring to what you said from Holland, well, um, and what Father has said. Well, I don't believe that we can regulate this from the government side uh, in detail. But I think the government has a very important role initiating and maybe also helping the society to find what is our basic rights. Because I think this is the confusion from, for a lot of people out there, that they don't know what rights they have to say to the companies or to also public institutions, what can you do with uh, my data? And uh, before we do this, before we know about what is our fundamental rights in the new world where you cannot delete everything and so on, uh, it's very difficult for people to engage in this discussion unless you are a young people being an expert or unless you are a company also being an expert. So we need to know our fundamental rights. Thank you. But they have the same rights. I mean, there's a, a right to privacy and everybody knows that. I don't understand. There's no new right. Hello, my name is Ludo, Ludo Kaiser. Uh, maybe you can guess where I'm from when I'm sitting here. Um, I just want to say that I would like to keep the right to give up my privacy completely. Thank you. Okay, that opened a whole new discussion here in the very end of the, uh, of the debate. Um, but, Margot Sarastana, you've been... Point well taken. <laughs> Uh, point well taken. <laughs> um, but referring to just because I really don't want like this discussion to be oversimplified, and I have the impression that it might be going on some points in this direction. So it's not our dilemma is not whether we want minimal or maximal data. That's not the true dilemma. Yeah? The true di dilemma is whether people can really control the data, data and make a choice. And that's, uh, that's something that we are aiming for. Yeah? So we are not aiming for minimal data. We are not aiming for maximal data. We are aiming for, um, for a choice of a consumer that they can control their data. And from all the surveys, it shows that this is what consumers want. This is what citizens want. Um, it's a little bit different for the public sector, because many of you mentioned also our um, Netherlands corner. Uh, many of you mentioned that state is, a, and you've mentioned, yeah, that state is, a, with state it is a little bit different because you have no choice whether you give your data to U.S. government or not with your U.S. citizen. The government simply has some data, yeah. So for the government, we have special rules that say that you can only use minimal data for a, that is needed for a certain purpose. But this is for a public sector, and otherwise we aim for a, for a, uh, for a good balance that would be between minimum and maximum. And try to be forgotten. Um, I think, to be honest, I don't know anyone <laughs> very serious right now involved in the discussion who is still advocating right to be forgotten. And let me tell you, it's a success of the current dialogue that we are having. It's a success of the dialogue that is going on around the uh, general data protection regulation. Yes, there were organizations and governments who at first wanted this right because it sounds great. It sounds great. It is tempting. Every one of us has made mistakes in the past. Everyone has a picture from a party uh, in the internet that you might not be very happy about. And the, like, uh, 
giving a chance, like, or at least suggesting that there might be a chance to erase those facts from your past that were a mistake. It's tempting, right? It's tempting, and every one of us thinks, yeah, yeah, okay, if it was possible, it would be great. But it's technically not possible, and it was discussed for several months with technical community, with NGOs, with uh, privacy protection officers, and so on. And now I think everyone who is in the discussion agrees that that's not the way to go. So let's not mock this discussion, let's just keep to what we agreed, yeah? So nobody really wants the uh, right to be forgotten, I believe, my, uh, from, from what I really uh, see from, from the dialogue right now. So no one is really advocating it to implement it into the current law, simply not because we don't want it, but because we agreed that it's technically really hard to, hard to achieve. I'm sorry I have to cut you off here because we're almost done and we still have questions from the floor and I want to hear, do we have remote participants? Um, okay. Sorry, but uh, I would like there's a few people who, who want to, and uh, you had a question down there. Yes, hi. Um, I'm a privacy professional, so don't all throw your bottles all at once. But um, I, it worries me a little bit, because uh, there have to be limits to choice, for example. So choice is not unbounded. And it worries me a little bit that... Um, you know, we're talking about compliance with laws. And this isn't a legal compliance issue. The law can only go so far. Um, you know, this is about the fact that the ecosystem, we talked about mobile, but the ecosystem is architected for disclosure by default. Mobile devices that you carry in your pocket are architected to be broadcasters of data by default. It's become extremely complex, and the network that underpins it is global. Data flows are immediate, and they're global. They cross borders. You know, your privacy, my privacy doesn't stop at the English Channel when I'm downloading an app from the US that has code in it that sends data to somebody else in Nigeria to analyze for advertising. So the key here is, it does require privacy professionals. It requires privacy engineers. That's why Google is hiring a bunch of them. It requires others to, how can we create user experiences that make it simple, that make it easy for you to make simple choices on your devices as well? You know, parking NSA and all that other stuff, and I don't agree with some comments that were made earlier. So parking all that, how do we design for trust? Because this is about designing for trust. Now, I haven't heard this conversation yet. It has to be made simpler for people to understand. I can show you a, a, a um, social network tool that I have on my device. That, I would argue, may be architecting the design to frustrate choice, because the frustration of choice supports the business model, which may not meet my privacy interests. Thank you for pointing that out because that's actually also what we're starting the discussion here is to design for privacy and innovating privacy. We have a, a comment from Bastian. Yeah, I would love to react to that. You say that there, that's very important that we gain more trust and we should find out how we should gain that trust. But you know, lots of people my age and I don't exactly know what's going on on the internet, how it works, um, what is being done with their data, and how can you trust in something of which you don't know what's going on. So we must first raise awareness and then trust. I do agree with you, the first awareness. Okay. We unfortunately don't have too much time. I would love to continue this discussion, actually, and also get more concrete on the definition of privacy, which we all can see here is a cultural construct, but still is important. Um, and the innovation in privacy and looking at privacy as an opportunity. Um, is there anyone here at the panel who's, who's sitting and thinking, I would like to... to say something here in the end. No. Um, one last thing. Is anyone on Twitter? Uh, can anyone uh, tell me what has been retweeted the most, if anyone has tweeted from this session? Twitter is down, or like the internet is down most of the time, so uh, it oh. doesn't really work. Uh, the push so notifications get through, but you cannot load your timeline, so yeah. nope. Oh, well that's such a pity. But just to, to build up, thank you so much from all the panelists. It's been interesting and wonderful to hear from all the different perspectives. Clearly we can see and we've seen this generally at IGF that trust has been shaken somehow, maybe more for adults than for youth. And we need to rebuild the trust just to quote uh, Thomas Blast. And maybe it's a way to rebuilding trust is by innovating in privacy and be thinking of it as an opportunity, as an area we need to explore where we have to balance the advanced uh, innovations in other areas uh, to the innovations in privacy. So I just want to thank everyone. Uh, it was an interesting discussion and hope you have a wonderful continued IGF. Thank you.